Okay. So, uh, turn, okay, that's better. All right, yeah, so you're welcome to ask questions now. That's totally fun. Um, just put it in the chat, and I'll try to get to it if I can. Uh, yeah, a few familiar faces here. Thanks for joining me again. Hopefully we can, uh, you know, try to learn some stuff here. So it's live stream number 10. We'll go probably about 45 minutes, uh, something like that. Um, again, feel free to put questions in there at any time. I'll go through them periodically. So what I want to talk about today are coaxial controls. This is going to be position, our runout tolerance, profile, and concentricity. And I'm gonna uh, show an excerpt from um, Y14.5 2009 that you know, kind of shows these in a list. The one that isn't, you know, kind of a coaxial control, but is, I don't know, I guess it sort of is, is continuous feature. And I'll, uh, I'll probably go through that one first. I've got one drawing from last week, um, the, uh, the blank drawing that I shared somebody, I forgot to put it on my website or whatever, but somebody screenshotted it and put some uh, gd &T on it. So we'll talk about that. And I really want to talk about a dynamic profile as well. I, I found this treasure trove of um, small engine drawings on like Telegram. Uh, you know, like model airplane engines and like steam engines, like little model ones. And, uh, you know, obviously the drawings aren't like engineered or anything. They don't have GD&T on them. They're very, very basic. But they are drawings and they're multi-details too, which is cool because you can have assembly parts on one sheet. So for somebody like me, it's very easy to talk about. Okay. So we'll get to this soon. This is a uh, user submitted and there should be another one in there. Uh, and this is what I mean by these uh, model drawings, right? There's several uh, different parts on one sheet. And I know there's like a 30 second delay. So I got to kind of pause as I'm going through uh, talking here. All right. So that's not the one I want to talk about first. This one. It's just a single part. Well, I guess it has this little part, this little oil tube. But what we're going to look at here, and oh no, Santiago, I haven't had a chance to uh, really go through that yet. It is in my PowerPoints deck. Um, I'll see if I can talk about the uh, the one part. Yeah, I'll see what I can do. I, when I see what I could do, I mean, like today, I'll see what I can, you know, put up on the screen here and talk about. Uh, okay, so we're looking for the outside diameter for this little piston, and I get that from here. And I swear I had it found before. Oh, here we go. So this outside diameter is point eight seven three. I don't know, there's at least one person in the chat that is like, oh, please use metric. Uh, I've been trying to use metric more when I'm just giving uh, examples, but this drawing's in inches, and there's really nothing I can do about it. I can't do, can't do the conversions to three decimal places in my head. All right, so we're saying we got this diameter of 0.873. This is what I see as a prime candidate for the continuous feature symbol. So I see continuous feature being used when you essentially have a cylinder that's been cut on a lathe and you then cut grooves into it, right? The, the, although this isn't the definition, that's kind of how I see it being used or how it should be used. So in this case, we have this piston. We've got one, two, three diameters that are working together, right? If any one of them is too big, it won't fit if any one of them is too small right it'll rattle around right they're basically one feature one cylinder that's been separated by these grooves now why am i going on about this i think it means something different if you have like a dog bone right if you have a, a dog bone shape like this right and these are going to be you know cylinders diameter or something Right. This could be a continuous feature and it's possible that it's kind of used as a continuous feature, like a hydraulic uh, 
uh, you know, valve or whatever. Uh, but it's not as clear to me uh, using continuous feature for that. Or even worse, I've seen, I totally disagree, uh, using continuous feature, say you have a cylinder and you have uh, something like this where you have two opposed calendar bores and you're going to be like, hey, this is a diameter continuous feature, right? Because they're two cylinders that are coaxial and the same size. I mean, it, it just doesn't, you know, pass the, like the smell test to me to be continuous, right? It's not continuous. Uh, but I've definitely seen that out there before where just because they're coaxial, uh, people continue them, consider them uh, continuous feature. Uh, and I forgot what the standard says about this. I know they updated it. Continuous feature was a 2009 thing they, they uh, you know, unleashed. And then they added some things in 2018, for example. I know it was unclear in 2009 whether you could use it on, like, surfaces. It was only shown with cylinders. I'm not super worried about that. We could definitely use it for cylinders, and it would look like this, right? We just put the continuous feature symbol after the dimension. You don't have to put the number of instances. Uh, that could be convenient if there's, like, a lot of grooves or something for whatever reason. Um it has downsides too, right? If it's not clear which diameters are being controlled by the continuous feature, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's the, the practice that's shown in Y14.5, just to put the continuous feature. And essentially now rule number one extends to all three of these diameters. And that effectively controls the coaxiality of the three diameters, right? It's a restrictive tolerance because your size tolerance I'm going to guess, yeah, plus or minus one half thousandths, right? Your size tolerance is plus or minus uh, 0 0.005. So your form, your maximum form deviation, cylindricity or straightness or whatever is a uh, ten thousandths, right? So that's equivalent to putting a cylindricity of ten thousandths on there or 0 0.01. Okay. So next up, oh, let me show you. Um, in the 2009, page 149, you can see when I was uh, studying for the exam or whatever, doing no lecture notes, I, I put little pictures here, which I think kind of helps. So selection of coaxial feature controls. One kind of gripe I think everybody has with Y14.5 is that it doesn't really explain like why you should use one thing over the other. So under, uh, I'll just read it. Selection of the proper control depends on the functional requirements of the design, right? That, that sounds super interesting. What's the functional requirements, right? So for position, where the axis or surface of features must be controlled and the use of RFS, MMC, or LMC material condition is applicable, positional tolerancing is recommended. Okay, so if you need MMC, right, if it's not spinning, right, if it's just fitting into something, sure, just use position. I'll try to show that in a minute. Uh, the next one <laughs> for runout, where the surface of a feature must be controlled relative to the data max, is runout tolerancing is recommended. That's not very descriptive, right? <laughs> what it really wants to say is, you know, when the surface relative to an app, it basically needs to give the definition for runout, uh, but it doesn't. It doesn't, I mean, because there's a whole chapter on that. And now uh, for concentricity, where the relationship between the derived median points of the controlled feature and the datum axis is a primary di design concern, or where that coaxial control of non-circular features is a design requirement, concentricity tolerancing is recommended. Uh, I'll explain that in a little bit. You know, that non-circular size thing could potentially be useful. I think it's been replaced by the dynamic profile. And, and functionality. So basically what it's saying is uh, if you have something that's spitting, right, and it's like a hexagon, right, you, you kind of have to, use, well, you don't have to, concentricity would be an option where it would definitely fail and run out check and position might not be applicable either. And then uh, for profile, where is desire to achieve a combined control of size, form, orientation, and location of a feature within the state of tolerance profile 
uh, tolerancing is recommended. Again, not very descriptive. I mean, it'd be really difficult to like make a design decision based on reading this, right? So that, I guess that's what I'm here for to kind of <laughs> try to show you uh, what number of standard is. This is our good friend, uh, Y145-2009. Okay, and you know, it says more stuff over here, right? It obviously goes into more detail, uh, but I'll, I'll skip most of that for now. Oh, no, FTP. Okay. All right, so let's look at. Okay, cool. Let's look at the first one. We'll go with position. So we're going to do a diameter. 0.873 plus or minus 0.05 one two three well so we'll say three times we need that if we're going to apply position and not continuous feature right. now we've got to decide what our datum is for this uh, and in this case it's kind of a weird situation the thing we're applying the position to should probably also be the primary datum. So the idea, just like an automobile, right, this piston, well, not just like an automobile. I think this one, I don't know if it has rings. I think it just directly slides on these surfaces. So in any case, in any case, it, uh, it matters, right? Probably more, it sets the orientation in space more than any other feature. So we'll do something a little special here. We'll go uh, zero at MMC, and we could actually just make this position our datum A, right? And I kind of do want to show this, because this is the one exception. Like when I teach position, I always say the ingredients for position are a feature control frame, basic dimensions, datums, uh, or and datums, right? Well. It's not always, you don't always have to have a datum reference right here. If it's th coaxial features and they're controlled together, the position is controlling those features. Now, in this case, the difference between this and continuous feature is basically nil. Uh, well, why is that? Well, if we have zero tolerance at maximum material condition, so we're saying 0.87, Wait, eight seven eight is the MMC size, right? There's zero uh, form variation. If we come in at our LMC size, so point eight six eight, right? Now we've got the total size tolerance worth of form variation, right? Uh, and by total size tolerance, I mean plus or minus the 0 0.005. So if you recall from a minute ago, that's how much tolerance there was when we used continuous feature. Uh, I made a video about this at one point. Somebody brought this up, and it's a very good point. It basically means the same thing. Now, you do get to use the number of instances, which may be helpful. It just depends on your design, right? It just depends what you want to put on your drawing. You might want somebody to really take a second look at this where a continuous feature I think is more likely to get kind of lost in the sauce right it's just another symbol whereas when you have a feature control frame say you're sending this out to get quoted or rep, they're more likely to see it and account for it etc uh, etc et okay now let's say we don't want to do that for whatever reason. I just want to show another example with this. So that was my, uh, you know, kind of go to, but let's say, oh, here we go. This uh, inside diameter, right, right here, is going to be data may. We could control those, those three features to that. So that's still, a, you know, a coaxial relationship. In green here is our datum axis, and we need the axis of each of these three diameters to be in relation to that. So what you end up with 
if the green line is our datum axis, you get a little tolerance zone, right, that extends as far as the feature extends. Now, this might freak you out a little bit. You might be like, wait, wait, wait. I thought it was like a cylinder that went all the way through the entire feature, right? Isn't that coaxiality? It really isn't, right? It, it doesn't matter. Well, any one feature, right, the axis can go in a different direction than the other features, but it's still restrained within that tolerance zone. So it shouldn't matter, uh, although they are, you know, I guess more free than if it was literally one big cylinder. And the advantage here, right, if we don't do zero MMC, so say we do, I don't know, uh oh, let me do a little racing here. Say we do zero six, right? Now we can give more tolerance if the feature comes in at a smaller size. It doesn't make a lot of sense for like a piston, right? Because this is going to fit into something. Again, I'm pretty sure that I could be wrong, but let's just go with the idea that in this design, there are no piston rings, right? So this cylinder is directly fitting. And I base that on this little note, uh, micro grooves help hold oil. So I'm, I'm pretty sure these outside diameters just go in, in there. In which case you can't have giant gaps. Uh, and what I mean is, Right, you can't have a part that comes out like this, right, where it's too small, because you're gonna get. Uh, is that for that? Oh yeah, you're right. Uh, point six eight is for. Where is the division? Point six eight. Six seven one. Man, this drawing sucks. I can't find any dimensions. Maybe I'm just bad at reading drawings. Okay, here we go. Uh, the 0.75. Oh, sh the author's name on here. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Um, uh, whoever made this drawing. Oh, Joe Webster. Joe Webster, yeah. The drawing doesn't suck. It's, it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> so let's make this datum A and get rid of that. Uh, yeah, Brian, you're right about the uh, that being the, the height of that slot. Uh, okay, so position is typically, if you're coaxial control like this, you would use it, you know, in a situation where uh, fit doesn't matter that much. So in this case, fit is the piston in the, you know, the cylinder. You don't want blow by of steam or, or, or combustion or whatever. Uh, and the part isn't necessarily going to be spinning, right? Because what can happen say here's our, our datum axis I'm way over here now with position you can uh, this is exaggerated but you can sort of get a part like this right whereas it gets smaller you have more tolerance for everything to be kind of shifted around uh, which would make it bad for spinning right if this again this is super exaggerated if this was spinning, right, it would, you know, destroy your bearings in like a heartbeat. Also, if you had to fit it into something and it was supposed to hold pressure, you know, you're going to get tons of blow by. But, and here's the thing, and hopefully you've, uh, you've stuck around for this. If its only job is to just fit into something, the smaller it gets, the, the, the better it fits, right? So if it's just dropping into something, uh, it's fine. Right, then position is the, the best tolerance to use here. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, and uh, the other thing about position <clears throat> is I can use uh, maximum material boundary. It doesn't really make a lot of sense right here. Um, the, the example, Y14.5 likes to use is this one right where you have like a you know a generic two diameter part uh, and you make right this uh, datum reference and then up here some diameter we're gonna go diameter blah 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 zero mmc 
We're gonna go A. Oh man. We're gonna go A at MMC. And what this allows us to do is check the part with a, a little receiver gauge, right? So we can verify everything except the, the lower limit on the size. center line in here so that's definitely an, uh, an advantage with position I'm gonna roll through here and uh, check for comments all right so yeah glad to have you back Chris and Brian uh, yeah BSC you're welcome to ask any any questions you want okay I see your question here if I have a cylinder shaped part with a height of 15 millimeters plus or minus one and a blind hole in the middle with the bottom flat and another flat side. Huh. Uh, let me see if I can draw that real quick. I, th I think that's descriptive enough. Okay. So we've got a cylinder shaped part. All right. Here's a cylinder. We're saying we got a height of 50 millimeters plus or minus one millimeter you know i will say writing metric dimensions is way easier right um it, the the whole numbers make it much much easier to deal with okay so little height blind hole in the middle so i'm not sure what he means by middle another flat side so i think think this is what he means or what BSC means I don't, I don't know uh, let's see okay so we got a blind hole in the middle with the bottom flat okay so I don't know if you mean So, yeah, BSC, if you're still on the stream, I'm, uh, for everybody else listening, I'm going to end uh, this pretty quick. You got to let me know if it's A or B. A uh, being a hole, you know, through the middle, perpendicular to the axis or parallel to the axis. So in the comments, just let me know if we're parallel to the axis or perpendicular to the axis of your cylinder. Okay. So for everybody else, we'll kind of move on here. All right, so we covered uh, right position. Now for runout. Runout is like oh wow, that's a oh that's a good one. Oh sweet, let's just use this. Runout was my favorite uh, section of the senior exam. I think I've talked about this before, but basically, you know, the senior exam is set up and sections and some of them have less questions than the others so say run out is like 10 percent of the exam uh, if you fail that one section you fail the whole exam so it pays dividends to like literally memorize the whole chapter on run out which is like eight pages uh, and get all of those you know couple handful of questions correct so uh, probably some of you out there have the same experience. You're like, yeah, I know run out like the back of my hand. It's like eight pages, and it's a huge part of the senior exam. It's also special in that run out was like the first, ge I don't know, if, the first geometric tolerance, and that people were already doing it. So when you make something on a lathe, you're checking it for trueness before you spool it up, right? Uh, and lathes have been around since, you know, <laughs> the Middle Ages. Uh, so it's something people have been looking for forever. Uh, on old-timey drawings, you might see TIM for total indicator movement or FIM for full indicator movement. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see it on this drawing somewhere for something like this. So this is a little flywheel, right, for our uh, our little steam engine. And I'll try maybe next week I'll put uh, the re there's like 20 pages to this drawing packet. Uh, shoot me an email if you want. Uh, a link to uh, like whatever this telegram group um, there's, there's some guy just post these 
for free. Uh, if you're the owner of this drawing, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, you know, uh, stop using it if you want me to or whatever. But I think they're free online. I don't know. Okay, so this thing spins, right? Pretty clear. <laughs> Any good flywheel will spin, or unless it's a broken flywheel, in case it won't spin, right? But this one hopefully will spin after we make it. We're going to have a, a, a shaft, right? So here's our crank. This flywheel fits over this little guy, which has a diameter of one half inch. So I'm going to go ahead and guess. Wait, am I wrong again? Oh, okay, I got it. Oh, man, I thought I was going crazy. Right. So there's going to be a, uh, a little bearing pressed in this thing. Whatever. It doesn't matter too much for now. What we want to do is make sure that whatever this cylinder is, is probably going to be the uh, our primary datum here. Yeah. Right, so it's going to be spinning about that. And you might ask, well, what, wouldn't it be better to make the whole outside diameter the primary datum? The answer is you could. But functionally, I don't think it makes as much sense as making, you know, this, right? This is what the thing spins about. And, you know, when you model this up in SolidWorks or Onshape or Creo or whatever, right, that's what you're modeling it about. So sometimes when you're modeling things, you're like, oh, yeah, that's where the datums are going to be because that's how I modeled it. Um, you know, that's contingent on, like, learning good, you know, modeling practice. Uh, but, you know, when you're modeling something, basically your top front and right planes and your CAD software should more or less match up with your uh, with your datums. Okay, check it out. This outside diameter is what we're really worried about. This is where runout is really, really sweet. So what does runout do? Let's let's just use circular runout for right now. Let's say we're gonna do a circular runout to five thousandths to datum a right this size tolerance is already plus or minus five now run out is a little weird it can the run out tolerance can be bigger than the size tolerance or smaller than the size tolerance why is that right if you recall right if we had something like cylindricity Right? Our cylindricity, the maximum cylindricity we can have is equal to the total size tolerance. If our cylindricity is larger than the total, total size tolerance, then rule number one takes over unless we, um, you know, uh, invoke independency or is it interdependency? I think it's independency, whatever. Unless we put the, the I symbol in there, which nobody does, right? Don't worry about it. Um, so it's natural to think, oh, well, run out that tolerance can't be bigger than the, the size the total size tolerance either right because we're controlling the form we are controlling the form so if you're unfamiliar with the run out right we get an indicator which is just a, a little uh, whatever uh, thing that that reads the surface so this indicator as we spin this around the indicator moves up and down so it's going to read the variation of the surface and we're going to get the, the difference between the high and the low reading is going to be our total indicator movement. So if our indicator starts at zero and it goes up one millimeter and down two millimeters, you know, through a whole 360, our total indicator reading or run out value is three millimeters, right? So up one, down two, uh, the total is three. If it goes from zero to three, back to zero, it's three, right? You know, it, it shouldn't be too bad to understand that. But that's going to control the form, right? Uh, so the circularity or cylindricity. But it also controls the coaxiality. So that's why it can be larger than the size tolerance. Now, if you just had the size tolerance with no runout on a drawing like this, what can happen is, right, and even... Was there? I don't know if there's any. Whatever. There's no. 
coaxiality control anywhere on this drawing. So what does that mean? Well, that means somebody makes this crankshaft pulley, right? They can make it like this, right? Where this feature is shifted way over here, right? What's to stop them? Because I could go through, and so imagine this, we've got that center hole shifted over a bunch, like a half an inch, right? How are you going to prove, given the information here, that that's wrong, right? There's no dimension that controls that. Uh, and normally it doesn't matter, right? Because machines make parts that are coaxial. So you'd assume if you make this on a lathe, right, you chuck it and you drill the hole or whatever, it, all the things are going to be coaxial. But you don't inspect things for what you think is true. You know, you're, you're looking for something that's wrong, right? So you're not going to know it's wrong before you check it, generally, whatever. Um, so that's why we apply the coaxiality control. So even if we did a run out that was, I don't know, uh, 0.13, like a big number there, that still controls the coaxiality more than none at all, right? So without the runout, there is no coaxiality. And rule, rule number one doesn't help you with coaxiality because rule number one only applies to individual features unless you unleash the continuous feature symbol, but that wouldn't help you here because these they're not continuous features. Uh, so that's why we got to use a run out position, uh, concentricity, or profile. Uh, run out, in this case, might be the most forgiving and the most functional uh, because we're going to essentially, what we have here is a total size tolerance of 10,000, so it's, it's plus or minus 5. So that's essentially giving us a cylindrous, a circularity of 10 thousandths. Right, so we've got our circular runout controlling. Let me just put that in there. Uh, controlling the coaxiality. The size controls the size and the form. Right, so it, it's interesting. You know, it's, it's something to to consider there. Uh, oh, uh, so why is runout beneficial? On something that spins, essentially, what runout lets you do. This, this flywheel, it could probably vary in diameter by a lot, right? I'm talking like, you know, a couple millimeters or an eighth of an inch and work just fine, right? And the reason I say that is because these, these equally spaced holes are optional, right? So if you could remove all of this mass and it don't make a difference, then you could have, you know, add or subtract mass from the outside diameter. So what you could do here is instead of saying 0.375, I could say 0.375 plus or minus a quarter or an eighth of an inch, right? That's a big tolerance. But then I could come in with a, uh, a run out to a much more reasonable value. So what I'm trying to get across here is this diameter can vary a lot. But the form still needs to be within this smaller number. Now the runout takes over for the form because it's smaller than the total size tolerance. And the coaxiality is controlled to that smaller number. So if you think about uh, like a, a modern automobile, right? You got all these pulleys, right? They're connected together, you know, however, and they've got like a tensioner. In there so any pulley could be a little bigger or a little smaller than the other ones and the tensioner will take up the slack right so what I mean by tensioner is that there's one pulley on a spring that's like pushing up against the belt uh, but if you have a pulley that's out of round by this you know you know whatever number you're gonna wear out bearings and it's gonna kind of shake itself to death right so run out can be really useful for this for things that spin that you know are going to spin and service run out is like the best thing ever now real quick the difference between circular and uh, total run out circular run out will allow this basically right so what i'm trying to draw here is this kind of humpty surface 
what I'm trying to show is that in this direction, you've got the total size tolerance. So point two six, right? Plus or minus point one three. In this direction, right, the direction that it's like spinning about, you've got point zero two, right? So you control it in one way more than the other. And for something that's spinning, generally that's okay. Uh, although it's a circular run out, it's not necessarily going to look like this. What you could end up with, and if you are designing like belts and pulleys and stuff, right, this could be bad. It could use all the tolerance like this and be tapered, right? So it just depends on what it is. For a flywheel, there's no belt, so I don't care if it's tapered, right? Don't matter to me. Um, it, it wouldn't necessarily work for everything. Okay, let me um, answer some questions here. Uh, so do you have a course or could you recommend any resources for someone who's brand new to GDT and fabrication, mechanical concepts as a whole? Uh, yeah, um, see if your company will pay for training. Um, you know, if, if you're uh, already working for somebody, uh, if you're, let's see, let me switch over here. It really depends uh, what your level is. If you're like already working as, as a designer or an engineer and you're using drawings all the time, uh, see if your company will buy you a copy of Y14.5. Uh, it's good to have. And if, you know, if you're, I know I say to buy that. If you're starting out 100%, a textbook is good. And you can search my library. I've made a couple of videos on, on good textbooks for explaining things. Basically, if you're trying to teach yourself, you want you want something like this workbook with answers. Uh, a typical textbook for a college isn't going to give you answers, and that can be really tough if you're trying to figure this stuff out on your own. Um, so this book, you know, half of the book is just going through answers, which I think is super helpful. Uh, there's my video library on YouTube. Obviously, you found me. If you're looking for like asynchronous type training uh, with like, you know, videos and questions to answer. Oh, oh why does that not come over? Huh. Oh, that's duh. This is a good uh, resource. I think GDT Basics, they, they have a course for individuals you can purchase and kind of go through and uh, do like that. They've also got some online stuff uh, as far as what the symbols mean. Um, I think you can get training straight through ASME. I know the GDT Basics is, is pretty legit as far as their you know, individual training. Um, that you can you know purchase and you know, do at your own time. I think that they also do uh, like public virtual trainings uh, that you can also you know you know pay for and all that stuff. So I think that's about the the long and short of it. Like uh, you know textbook, uh, the question and answer book will help you. Uh, you you can find questions you didn't know you had, and then you might find a video I made that answers it. Uh, Okay, let me uh, move on here. Training videos applying to GD&T and stack ups. Not that many. I got like a couple. Um, uh, let me pull it up from here. So here's my YouTube channel. Talk stack up beautiful playlist. Yeah, yeah, not like earth shattering amount. I mean, more more than you'll probably find anywhere else. Uh, so the vector method, inner and outer boundaries, 
uh, and some kind of explanation. It was, wow, it's a really popular video for me. 43,000 views. Um, that's a good way to get started. And then uh, check out, again, this book, this guy, uh, James D. Meadows. I forgot what it's called, but he's got a book that's uh, on Tolerant Stack Up, like with answers, that's really, really good for kind of teaching yourself. It's one of the, it's like math, right? It, it's one thing to watch a video. You got to get like some examples and like work through them and stuff. So a book can be super helpful for that. All right, let's, um, okay, got that. <laughs> oh, thanks, ladies, Davey. Appreciate it. All right, uh, let's move now. Oh, wow, it's already 45. So let, we, uh, we did run out. Let's talk about concentricity. So concentricity, if you ever take like a GD and T class or like, you know, most trainers will tell you straight up, like, just don't use concentricity, right? It's bad. And I won't necessarily agree with that. I think it doesn't do what a lot of people think it does, but I really don't think it's like the end of the world. It does something really kind of special. So... If we take a really simple uh, little part here, so I want to control, oh, that's a terrible color, All right? We're going to make this larger diameter, or datum A, and we're going to control this smaller diameter to uh, datum A. So let's say 20 millimeters plus or minus 4. And this time we're going to use uh, concentricity. So here I'm just going to kind of explain what the tolerance is. So concentricity, unlike runout, will have a diameter symbol in the feature control frame, right? Which is weird. All right, we got that diameter symbol. So we've got a datum axis, right? There's always going to be a datum axis with concentricity, right? Right in the middle of the part. That's established up here uh, by this datum feature symbol. The concentricity tolerance zone is going to kind of look like position, right? It's a cylinder that's coaxial with the datum axis. Like right now, it's not any different than position, right? As far as how it's set up. Datum axis, cylinder on the datum axis. What makes it different from position is that with position, right, say we have our part came out like this, our position, we're looking for the axis of the unrelated actual mating envelope. So what does that effectively mean? Right, we've got to find a similar cylinder, right? or a cylinder, right, that collapses. So imagine, I never have one when I need one, a drill chuck, right? You, you spin it and it closes down all at once. You find that the axis of that unrelated actual mating envelope is the axis of that position. So if we use our methodology from over here, we're trying to see if that axis is in a tolerance zone, right? Uh, on our datum axis, tolerance zone centered on our datum axis, right? With concentricity, we're not controlling the axis of the unrelated actual mating envelope. We're controlling derived median points. 
and they're Diamet I don't I can't I forget if you need both of these words. I think they mean the same thing. Diametrically opposed drive median. If it's a median, it's diamet No, I think you need all four. Diametrically opposed derived median points. Now diametrically, I don't really like that word because it's not always a diameter. But I don't I don't claim to be a, a geometry expert. Basically what this means is that instead of controlling the axis with this unrelated mating envelope thing, we're going to be looking. Uh, let me find, let me. So say our cylinder came out like this, right? Imperfect. At every two opposed points, right, two points at 180 degrees apart, we're going to find the center, right? And we do that all around the part. And what we end up with is like a cloud of points, right, in the center of the part. And I'll try to use a, a couple different colors here, right? So we're looking for all these points in the center of the part and then we want to see if they're all within a cylindrical tolerance zone uh, every uh, you'll see textbooks where they have like two dial indicators that are opposed and it's like it's never a picture of them actually doing it it's always like a, a illustration I've never seen anybody do that. If you've ever seen anybody do that and you can explain like how it works, please DM me. I'd be super curious to know. Um, never seen anybody do that in real life. A CMM can crush this, right? You put it on a CMM, tell it measure, it'll get points, it'll do all the math, whatever. It's not a big deal. It's not, let me get to this in a second. All right, so what's it useful for? Well, what it does is control the distribution of mass. So whereas runout does the same thing, but is more restrictive. So what I mean is, if instead of a circle here, and I could just leave that, we could control a square to a datum axis. And we could conceivably get, right, diametrically opposed points On a square right where all the points are in yeah are in the middle so if you think about it yeah of course right there there are spinning parts that are hexagons or octagons not so much squares but as possible um, and they're balanced what you can't control with concentricity are things with uneven numbers so uh, Brian you're right you you couldn't use a triangle or a, a, a pentagon. Uh, they're not distributed the same. Same thing, you couldn't control like a lobed part. I mean, you know, I'd be super curious to know how they uh, dimensioned uh, the, uh, the rotors for like those Mazda uh, RX engines, the, the rotary engines. It's definitely not concentricity. Those things spin at like super high RPMs. I mean, they probably just use profile or something, but. That'd be interesting to uh, to see. I mean, there's a lot of it. Yeah. I'd love to have access to a lot of different, you know, drawings of cool stuff, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. Okay. So it allows things to, basically it controls the balance of mass. So I, I don't know this, but my guess is this was a way to kind of make things balance, like off the machine and avoid having to dynamically balance something. So when you go get your tires done in your car, they, they take your wheel and tire, put it on a machine, like spins it, and that's how they know where to put the weights. I'm going to guess at concentricity. Tolerancing is a way to kind of avoid that or at least reduce that kind of secondary process. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not really into like turbine manufacturing and things. So I don't know if it was worth it or what. I do know they got rid of it in the 2018 version of Y14.5. And ISO, they have the concentricity symbol. It doesn't mean this, this derived median points business, totally different. It basically just means what position means in ISO. 
Um, oh, oh, the run out, run out, run out, right. So you'll often hear uh, with concentricity, like people are checking it with run out and they're wrong. They don't know what they're doing. They might not know like the difference or anything, but here's the deal. As long as it's not a square, right? Say we're, we're doing concentricity, right? Kind of same part here. And we're going to diameter of something, doesn't really matter. Concentricity, diameter of four uh, millimeters for our tolerance zone. If we check this for run out and our reading is less than two millimeters, we're good, right? And I'm, I'm cutting that in half, right? So this is the tolerance zone right here. And run out is measuring this, right? So we're going to cut the concentricity in half. As long as our run out, right, is less than this number, it passes a concentricity as well. Now, what can happen is if it fails the run out check, it doesn't necessarily fail concentricity, right? Because recall, concentricity can be used on a hexagon. A hexagon will always fail run out. Well, not always. It, it could be large enough run out tolerance where it wouldn't, but it's, it's unlikely. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, you can verify, but you can't verify that a part is rejectable with run out and only for cylindrical stuff. Okay, <clears throat> so our last one here let's talk about profile. So they've had profile in Y145 for a long time uh, for surfaces of revolution Why did I, do that? I don't see it that often now maybe you see it all the time in your industry uh, please dm me let me know if you use profile for like in the place of run out it's possible it's kind of difficult to check in process because remember run out you've got a size and the run out with profile Right, your size and your location, and your uh, form, and they're all bundled up. So to check this with like a dial indicator, you've got to find out where zero is, because you've got to establish this four. This uh, here, let me draw it. Right here's our true profile. It's a diameter of twenty millimeters. Our tolerance zone. Right two concentric cylinders about that true profile, total of four millimeters. So to verify anything, we've got to find out where the zero is and set our indicator right here. Right, that's <laughs> easier on paper than it is in real life. Whereas with run out, we could just stick that indicator, you know, on this part surface. It's not with the location. Um, so profile can be much more difficult. Now, on a coordinate measuring machine, maybe it doesn't really matter. Um, but, you know, you don't want to just uh, doom all parts to have to be measured on a, a coordinate measuring machine. Uh, runout does give you some optionality. Um, if you're controlling... you Well, let's say this. You can use uh, maximum material boundary with uh, profile, which can possibly maybe help on a CMM inspection and in that this part, you could conceivably drop it into a fixture instead of having like a chuck or something hold it or having to clamp it into a V block. I mean, the difference might be marginal, but I don't know if you're making 50 billion of something, it might be, uh, might be helpful. All right, so, oh yeah, I'm definitely going over time. All right. 
So what I'm going to do here, we're already at, yeah, we're at an hour. So uh, I'm going to have to save some of the stuff I was going to talk about for next time. So this drawing, I'll talk about next time somebody sent this in. I think they did a great job. Next time I want to talk about uh, dynamic profile. And I'm going to apply it to these weight saving holes here. I think there's some really interesting stuff you can do with dynamic profile. And I haven't seen that much about it uh, out there. Oh, by the way, I've got uh, probably this week, hopefully, uh, a video about surface uh, surface metrology coming out. So keep a lookout for that. I'm uh, interviewing a uh, uh, you know, leader in the industry about his business and uh, surface metrology. It's, I think it's going to be really great. It'll be my first, like, you know, podcast interview. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. Uh, da -da. A couple of you asked me about the uh, these drawings. Uh, shoot me a, a DM on LinkedIn or my email or whatever, and I'll, I'll give you a link to the uh, the Telegram. Okay, uh, here's a question. I simplify the runout by saying that circular runout equals circularity plus concentricity, and for total runout equals cylindricity plus concentricity. Oh, that's interesting, Ali. Uh, simplify the runout by saying. But when you say saying, do you mean that's what you put on the draw? Oh, okay, I think I see what you mean. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, so circular runout equals circularity plus concentricity. I think that makes sense. Uh, to explain to somebody, yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, I don't have to think about it a little bit further as far as it is it legit to the standard or whatever. But yeah, if it helps you get the point across of what's going on, for sure. All right, everybody. So I'm going to close this up uh, in about 30 seconds or so. Yeah, I've been going for a, a solid hour. So thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back next week, and I'll, I'll try to... Uh, I deliver on all the stuff I said I was going to do at the the beginning here. I guess I went over on uh, the coaxiality stuff. It is pretty exciting though, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, please like the video, comment um, on LinkedIn and uh, YouTube if you can. Um, so, yeah. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and kill this now. I will see everybody next week.